Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. Hi, my name is Travis McVeigh. I'm an anesthesiologist from Dallas, Texas. I host a podcast called Thank You Notes at Ars Longa Media. Showing gratitude to people just makes me feel good, and I want to share the practice of thank you notes with everybody who listens. I write thank you notes to people and then bring them on the show to read it to them. Past guests have included my high school teachers, my friends, other physicians, and a couple of internet celebrities. I will also be doing episodes that explore the science behind gratitude practices to demonstrate to everybody the actual tangible benefits of practicing gratitude. Listen everywhere you get podcasts and check out the extras on my social media accounts. Thank you for listening. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. And now here's your host, Patrick Beeman. You're listening to an archived episode of our 2017 Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1. Yeah, so uh, tell us a little bit about uh, where you're at and in your career and what you do for Lacturio. Great. So in my career, I finished my medical uh, training in the United States, and I'm now uh, a resident, actually, in uh, the New York area. So I'm working through my pathology residency. For Lecturio, I help them with their medical content. So when they go in new directions or they're trying some new material, right now we're focusing on developing our USMLE-style questions. Uh, We want to grow our QBank. So uh, right now uh, we help edit and develop that content map and find quality uh, authors to help us write the questions. And then we kind of uh, help, uh, help our supervisors and help the rest of the Lecturio team integrate that into their programming. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, so what's your title? My title, um, I'm a member of the Medical Advisory Board. And how long have you been uh, with them? I've been working with Lecturio since I had some free time in fourth year of medical school. I don't recommend it for every medical student, but I'm kind of, um, I I can't sit still. Got to keep busy. Got to, even after I had my uh, appendix removed, (laughs) they wanted me to take a week off and I I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal. (laughs) You sound like uh, most of us in medicine, so. Right. Did you to look at your own uh, pathology under the microscope? You know, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I read the report, and uh, they called it necrotic. So we were moving uh, closer to perforation than I was comfortable with. But uh, <laughs> all right. am, it all worked out. Awesome. Well, on that note, I will say that Lecturio has asked us to advertise uh, the fact that you they are looking for more question writers and you can send an email to jobs at lecturio.com to get more information on that. And there's probably no better way to increase your abilities in test taking than to become a question writer to learn to construct your own USMLE style practice questions. So if you're a uh, fourth year, um, third year, um, even after you've taken step two, Learning how to write questions will serve you well throughout residency and then as you become an attending uh, to take written board exams and, of course, for USMLE Step 3. The amount of study I put in as a resident, well, this happens to all residents, (laughs) dropped considerably from medical school, but in preparation for in-service exams or even my board exams after residency was probably um, half of what it had, uh, had been in medical school hour for hour since I had done so much in terms of uh, writing and editing multiple choice practice questions. So if you're interested, uh, send an email to jobs at lecturio.com and you can work at Lecturio. 
But uh, today, let's get into some pathology questions. These are the sorts of things that I think a lot of people in clinical medicine get removed or, or are far removed from, except for the pathologists who still, I guess, engage that, that content uh, a lot more than uh, people who are, you know, in surgery, uh, in OBGYN, in pediatrics. Um, I suppose the dermatologists do a bit of this as well, but pathology is, is sort of the, the step one clinical specialty, the specialty that is most uh, relevant to step one, I would believe. The step one specialty par excellence. And I guess that's proven by the fact that the inimitable Edward Gullion himself was a uh, is a pathologist, and it seems like a lot of medical educators uh, fall into your specialty, um, especially those who teach uh, medical students uh, early on. Yeah, we like to call ourselves like we teach the doctors, or we uh, we're, we're the we, we teach other physicians. They come to us with their questions, and uh, we help them understand what their what the disease, the etiology, or uh, uh, help them develop a, a good pathway to um, treatment and therapy. Yeah, plus um, your specialty probably is the most commonly represented specialty amongst uh, like uh, television and movies. You know, there's always a pathologist being consulted by the police or whatever in, uh, you know, crime shows and whatnot. <laughs> right, so. right. That new uh, Will Smith movie, uh, new, it's like two years old, that Will Smith movie, I guess, uh, Concussion? Yeah. I, I think the original story was kind of organized by a pathologist. Awesome. All right, let's get into this. We're going to start with a little warm-up question, more of a, a recall than anything. So I'll read this stem. We have a 14-year-old male who presents to the emergency department with severe abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. He's disoriented to time and place and shows ku small breathing. Abdominal examination showed generalized tenderness without guarding or rigidity. And his vitals include a normal blood pressure and pulse. His labs show a random glucose level of 628. His pH is decreased. His PCO2 is decreased. Serum ketones are positive. His serum sodium is decreased, serum potassium is elevated, and serum bicarbonate is decreased. Which of the following glucose transporter is non-functional in this person? And I will say that uh, I'm kind of doing a different approach in terms of reading the the uh, numbers in uh, complicated stems with lots of uh, vitals and or labs, and that is to note decrease or increase um, for most of them. At any rate, answer choice A is GLUT1, B, GLUT2, C, GLUT3, D, GLUT4, and E, the GLUT5 transporter. All right, and the correct answer is, is what here? The correct answer is D, GLUT4. All right, I'm just going to confess. I <laughs> I read this and I was like, uh, what are the glutes again? <laughs> to me, they are uh, a muscle that one one works out in the gym uh, by doing deadlifts. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and this other thing. Yes. So these glucose transporters, super important to get glucose into the cells. And some of them are constantly working, like in the brain, in the red blood cells. And some of them are regulated carefully by the body. So in this patient, we have uh, all these indications of elevated blood sugar. Yeah. And he's not using that blood sugar. So now he's breaking down his fats, turning them into ketones. Those ketones are causing um, a metabolic acidosis. It's resulting in his heavy breathing. He's trying to remove carbon dioxide from his blood, so resulting in that uh, small breathing. And the decrease in PCO2, if I recall. That's right. That's right. Rapid breathing reduces PCO2. Perfect. But why? Why? What's going on? Well, he's not using his blood glucose effectively. He's using his fat. So that all kind of points to some sort of uh, diabetes, some sort of diabetic issue. Perhaps uh, he has diabetes type 1. Perhaps he has diabetes type 2. Well, in diabetes type 1, 
These are usually found in uh, in younger patients, and we have a 14-year-old patient here, mm-hmm. where their pancreas is, is not producing sufficient amounts of insulin. And that's the hormone that regulates the GLUT4. It upregulates expression of the GLUT4 transporter on the cell membrane, right? Yep. So... Um, sorry to interrupt, but then I guess, is this the pathophysiology more of a type 1 diabetes uh, because they lack insulin more than have insulin resistance or or no? Right, right. Type 1 diabetes. I guess I'm saying, is this a, a decreased functioning of the GLUT4 transporter? Is that a pathophysiologic uh, mechanism common to diabetes in general or more specific to type 1? It's more specific. Well, in type one, the lack of insulin prevent it precludes the expression of GLUT4 on the external membrane of the transporter. In diabetes type two, the the receptors for insulin are no longer responding to insulin. So even if there's a certain level of insulin produced by the pancreas, you're not getting that response to express the GLUT4 transporters. And that results in an insensitivity to your insulin. And this is uh, found in older patients, usually with consistently elevated blood glucose level. Yeah, that makes sense. But I interrupted you. Uh, What were you going to continue saying? Sorry. Hope I didn't Uh, ruin your train of thought, derail your train of thought. Totally gone. Totally gone. That's fine. So I guess uh, the takeaway here is... Um, and in your opinion, too, I guess, uh, of the, the glute transporters listed here, uh, GLUT4, is it probably fair to um, consider the most important one to remember for step one type stuff? Yes. If you're talking about diabetes, yeah. GLUT4 is your, is, the, is your go-to. But, you know, the GLUT1 is also super important. And GLUT3 is super important. These, these are constantly active. They're they will, they will consume all any and all blood glucose avail uh, glucose available in the blood. Okay. And then, but these other ones, like uh, uh, the, some of these other ones, are also relatively important. But the GLUT one and GLUT three are will consume any blood glucose available, while GLUT four is regulated by insulin. So you know, it, it depends on what the question. Yeah. So GLUT four, I imagine, mostly found in in which tissue then uh, spread uh, all throughout the body, or a majority. It's all throughout the body, but it's, when you think about glucose intake, we're also thinking about muscles. We yeah. want to get that glucose into the muscles, and that's how we're regulating this. GLUT four is also regulated by um, exercise. You can increase your expression of GLUT four a little bit by exercise. Okay. All right, yeah. cool. Any other high yield points you can think of from this little warm up recall question? No, I don't think so. I think it's best to move forward. All right. So the next one we have is a three year old male is brought in because the parents notice that his skin is becoming yellow. He's awake, calm, and looks healthy, except for a yellow tone of his skin and sclera. The mother said the boy eats well, has normal stool and urine color. He was born of a a healthy pregnancy and delivered vaginally without complications. His serum testing shows a higher value of unconjugated bilirubin. Complete blood count is within normal limits. The mother mentions that her sister died as an infant, but doesn't know the diagnosis. The only thing she knows is that her sister had an exchange transfusion. The baby is treated with phototherapy, but the jaundice only becomes more apparent and unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia persists into the second week of life. What is the most likely diagnosis in this case? A. Gilbert or Gilbert syndrome. B. Neonatal jaundice. C. Krigler-Najjar syndrome type 2. D. Hemolytic anemia. Or E. uh, Krigler- Najjar syndrome type 1. And the answer here is... Uh, E, Krigler-Najjar syndrome type 1. These types of questions are annoying when you've got like, you know, maybe you're reading through it and you're thinking, oh, I know this is Krigler-Najjar, right? And then uh, you get to the answer choices. It's type 1 and type 2. Right. So... How do we keep that straight? <laughs> well, I guess first, what is Krigler in a jar? Remind me. 
Right, right. This is a genetic disorder of bilirubin conjugation. Now, recall that in the liver, the liver conjugates the bilirubin to, um, and then uh, passes it into the bile system to, uh, into, and then into the duodenum and small intestine. And then some of that bile is actually reabsorbed and some of it is passed in the stool. But here we're talking about a genetic disorder where you're, the conjugation of bilirubin is not efficient. But this is, this is type 1. And in type one Kriegler Najjar, it's it's the severe type. Okay. Right. So you have type one that's severe that will get worse over time, and then you have type two, which is less severe and might might cause a transient uh, jaundice, that yellow discoloration of the skin, uh, jaundice. Uh, Kriegler Najjar type two uh, would might have a transient jaundice. Type one, the more severe type, would have a increasing a worsening condition. Okay. I guess you can remember that by noting that uh, type 1, 1 is primary. So the the primary Krigler in a jar to worry about would be type 1. I guess that might be a mm. useful yeah. mnemonic. Absolutely. All right. Remind me then, uh, choice A was uh, uh, Gilbert syndrome. Um, what is that different? That also causes an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Right. This is one of those uh, benign conditions as well, but it's usually discovered later in life. Okay. Yeah. And then neonatal jaundice, uh, that's uh, usually seen, and that was choice B, is usually seen the first five days of life with the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia uh, that does not persist into the second week of life. And I suppose this is the one that is most often treated with phototherapy and, and which actually works, right? Right. It works very efficiently in neonatal jaundice. Others, other types of jaundice, not so efficiently. Okay. And then hemolytic anemia. <laughs> um, this is a complicated topic, if I recall, because when I was going to med school, I was actually reading Robin's pathology. And I just remember these, like, uh, these maps of the different hemolytic anemias or anemias in general. And I, I do know, I guess, can we talk a little more about the the unconjugated um, versus conjugated by looking at the stem uh, in terms of bilirubin. Like in the stem, for instance, it mentions that you have this um, this yellowing of the skin. Is it true that this is kind of a, a clinical sign that's more common with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia than conjugated? Am I remembering that correctly or no? So... Uh, the purpose of conjugation is to increase the solubility of the bilirubin. Okay. So if you conjugate it, it becomes soluble. It's easier to transport, but it also doesn't precipitate out of solution. Okay. So to my understanding, jaundice is more associated with unconjugated bilirubin. Because it's unconjugated, it is more likely to precipitate out of solution. It is more likely to bind to other tissues, and it's more likely to result in discoloration, uh, such as this jaundice. And you would also see it in the eyes. You'd see uh, ecteric uh, discoloration in the eyes. And then, of course, we're also really concerned about precipitation of this material in the central nervous system, potentially could result in death. Okay, so I guess... An easy way to think about the pathophysiology is if the liver is the sort of um, gatekeeper for conjugation and the liver's job is to conjugate the bilirubin, dump it into the hepatobiliary tract, eventually the, the gut, in order to have an elevated conjugated bilirubin, you're looking at some sort of obstructive process beyond the liver doing its job. So uh, like a, a duodenal obstruction, is that correct? Or uh, what else do you see it in like a biliary cirrhosis, I guess? Right. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that those are definitely uh, closely associated, definitely. Okay. All right. I'm not going to say any more about bilirubin because uh, I'm an OBGYN and uh, no one should have to learn um, the hepatobiliary system from me. Uh, <laughs> any other high yield points here we could note for kind of like step one content? No, uh, for step one, this is uh, you know remember that uh, the the difference between type one and type two. 
Uh, remember the, 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 all the steps associated with uh, the breakdown of hemoglobin into bilirubin, transport to the liver, conjugation at the liver, and then excretion into the biliary system, into the small intestine, and then a portion of that, of course, gets reabsorbed, and some of that passes in the stool. All of that whole system, that whole cycle is very important, and any disease that can disrupt that cycle is very important for step one, step two, and beyond into clinical practice. Gotcha. And I will say, uh, in the Lacturio pathology course, um, there are, in the gastrointestinal pathology subset, there are 132 videos, nine hours duration total, but there are 14 videos for pancreatic biliary disease and another 30 plus for liver. And specifically... Yes, yes. Those are... those are Our, our, our lecturer is Dr. Raj. He's fantastic. He... Uh, I, I see that he's called the... Uh, kind of like the new Golion. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> Yeah, he, he's also, uh, he, he, uh, if you sit through one of his lectures, he, he grabs your attention. He's, he's, he's incredibly dynamic and he, he flows very well from topic to topic to topic. And it's high quality material. It's very high yield. Yeah. And, uh, I guess specifically what I'm pointing, uh, trying to point out here is, um, it's probably worthwhile to to study all the things you mentioned here to find some resource that that really breaks down all of the complexities of of um, the conjugation or how the body deals with uh, bilirubin in general. So, and one of the free lectures on uh, Lecturio's platform is a four and a half minute take on conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Um, so that would be well worth uh, getting a. Uh, subscription or, or an account with Lecturio and uh, uh, walking through that uh, prior to your step one or uh, during that first, second year time when you're learning this stuff. So, all right, let's move on. Let's move on. These uh, next questions are a little more complicated in terms of their stem. So, uh, just uh, bear with me here. The Next is a 29-year-old woman who presents with a two-hour history of sudden onset, severe mid-epigastric pain that radiates to her back and also has profuse vomiting. Uh, the pain is unrelieved by antacid therapy, um, and she has no history of abdominal pain. She regularly consumes alcohol and recently finished off her third bottle of vodka for the month. On examination, she has uh, she is uncomfortable with a blood pressure of 95 over 40 and a heart rate of 105. Her lung examination reveals crackles at both lung bases. Abdominal examination reveals diffuse tenderness in the whole abdomen with marked guarding, rigidity, and hypoactive bowel sounds. A chest x-ray is normal, and an un abdominal CT scan reveals peritoneal fluid collection and a decreased attenuation and diffuse enlargement of the pancreas. Her laboratory findings show a mildly elevated AST and ALT. Alkaline phosphatase is elevated. Amylase and lipase are likewise elevated with a calcium of 7.1, which is decreased. Which of the following cellular changes is most probable to accompany these findings? And the answer choices here are, oh man, some of these bring back terrible memories. A, cassius necrosis, B, dry gangrene, C, colloquative necrosis, D, coagulative necrosis, or E, fat necrosis. All right, these these are hardcore pathology uh, terms. So what's the answer here? Okay, so we're dealing with the pancreas. We're dealing with uh, acute to pancreatitis. Okay. So the answer is fat necrosis. All right. So fat necrosis, the kind of like uh, uh, necrosis that's found in uh, uh, pancreatitis and also, if I recall, in um, you see this in step one questions after somebody's had uh, trauma to the breast tissue, like somebody um, uh, gets 
punched in the breast and then has this like um, darkened kind of lesion um, following uh, the trauma. Um, is that the same process or similar uh, thing? Similar process. You have trauma to the adipose tissue re releasing enzymes that kind of digest that local area. Uh, like you said, it can occur in the breast and result in some sort of like lytic lesion that they might find later, perhaps on a mammogram or during a, a self exam. And that might cause like uh, the whole process of evaluation and uh, ultrasound or FNA or exam. But it, yeah, so trauma to the breast can result in, uh, in fat necrosis. But in pancreatitis, it's, it's a much more extreme. The pancreas is full of these enzymes. And, and once you start irritating it with alcohol or you know, a, a biliary, a, a stone, a pancreatic stone, a biliary stone, all those enzymes just become active. You know, uh, another way to, uh, to irritate the pancreas is elevated triglycerides hmm. or uh, elevated calcium. It just activates all of those enzymes in the cells and then they just start digesting the pancreas. Now, when I do an autopsy, Sometimes it's really hard to find the pancreas because it looks just like a piece of fat. Yeah. And that's there is a great deal of fat associated with this organ. So uh, in this case, we have acute pancreatitis. We have all of our levels are telling us that, you know, there's something happening. The lipase uh, is elevated. So there's there's enzymes leaking into the system. The calcium is low. That indicates that the calcium is actually precipitating out of solution. Yeah. And that's term. Is that the term kind of we hear uh, like fat saponification? Right. Okay. That's right. Right. And it'll form this uh, like a white precipitant uh, in that area. And you'll actually see that on patho in, in the pathology on, on slides. Absolutely. Okay. But these other choices, these other choices are also quite uh, interesting uh, speaking as a pathologist. This caseating necrosis. Yeah. Caseous necrosis, right? That that should make you think of tuberculosis. You should go right to tuberculosis. It's the it's the caseating granuloma. That's what we're talking about here. And are these gross descriptions or microscopic histopathologic descriptions, descriptive terms? These are uh, these are histological terms. Okay. These would you could some of these like uh, the ca caseous necrosis, you you will find a gross finding there is something to see uh grossly when you approach the organ and it'll be like this cheesy uh, friable material um but then when you look at it under a microscope you're also going to see uh you know uh, giant cells and you're going to see you know necrotic uh, a necrotic center of this ball of inflammatory cells you know, then you can say that this is a caseating granuloma Ah, right. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, I think that point you made, uh, <laughs> caseating necrosis, in my mind, the first thing that, that uh, is associated, if this were a Rorschach test of uh, pathologic terms, I would have said tuberculosis. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, what about dry gangrene, which was choice B? Real quick, just to go back to caseating oh, yeah, granulomas, sure. it can also cause, be caused by funguses. So different fungi can cause that. Uh, so it's not just for tuberculosis. If we find a caseating granuloma in a lung, we do testing for mycobacter tuberculosis. In fact, any mycobacter. We also do fungus testing, and we, we look for both. Like histoplasmosis, trying to think what other uh, notable um, fungi. Aspergillus, stuff like those. Okay. But we do – it's a nonspecific stain, so anything that is like spore-forming or uh, hyphae-forming should stain positive with the material we use, yeah. Okay. All right. I won't ask you to get into all of those because <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's why you do a five-year residency, right, to learn all, all those uh, tissue reactions and, and how to make these things uh, show up and, and diagnose. Uh, pathology is a four-year residency now. Oh, is it? Yeah, and and uh, because it's a four year residency, they like us to do two fellowships. So, so by the time we're done, we're usually uh, board certified in uh, anatomic and clinical pathology, and then we'll have it one, at least one, usually two fellowships. Yeah, that sounds terrible. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I I just I I thought I wanted to do GYN oncology. 
um, which is originally why I went into OBGYN. But at the end of my four years, I was like, I don't think I can be a trainee and for another four years um, and do Genonc. But uh, okay, let's move on. Dry gangrene. Dry gangrene. So uh, this is a type of coagulative necrosis, and we'll, we'll get to coagulative necrosis in just a second. But there's something else. Uh, there's like a, there's like an inadequate blood supply, um, like some sort of peripheral vascular disease. Uh, I just saw an example of dry green, gangrene. It almost looked mummified. Ooh. The tissue it was a it was a above knee amputation, and 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 the toes they looked mummified. They looked dehydrated. The tissue was a blackened escher, and it was just it was just a just mummify. It's the best way for me to say a dry gangrene. Think mummification. See co- colliquative necrosis. Colliquative necrosis you might know better as uh, liquefactive necrosis. Ah uh, yes. Right. And when you think of liquefactive necrosis, the first organ to think of is the brain. Okay. The uh, brain. And I do think that uh, here's a good point, too. Uh, sometimes you will be on a test and you might know the, the process by one of its names, like uh, liquefactive necrosis, which to me seems more uh, common. Uh, but sometimes there is a, I guess, knowing the synonyms for uh, something uh, is also very useful. So colliquative necrosis, liquefactive necrosis, these are synonymous terms. Right. And Okay, so uh, liquefactive necrosis, brain. Right. And then uh, the final D uh, was coagulative necrosis. Tell us more about that. Sure, sure. So you have tissue breakdown, but when you look at the tissue histologically or under a microscope, it, it, it appears like normal tissue, except it's all dead. So all the nuclei will be gone, but you can still make out vasculature. You can still make out architecture of the cells in relation to each other. But it's just that the, 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 all the nuclei are, are, have been removed. Uh, and this is uh, due to uh, protein denaturation. It, there's so much protein in cells. As they go through the process of dying, uh, that protein can sometimes just uh, break down and then f- reform new bonds nonspecifically. And that helps stabilize the architecture of the cells and of the tissue. Okay. And this is what you see in like a myocardial infarction, correct? Right, right. Okay. Like the real, the tougher organs, you'll see this a lot in. Like we talked about liquefaction necrosis in the brain. You have fat necrosis in the breast and the pancreas. This is for like the heart okay. and the adrenals and the kidneys. Really tough organs here. Okay. <laughs> One's doing a lot of the work. Um, right. All right. Um, any any other high yield kind of pearls for necrosis i would focus on uh these are these are relatively straightforward questions and i would focus on this word association Mm -hmm. caseating necrosis or caseating granuloma think tuberculosis or fungus Uh, a non-caseating granuloma so this is that ball of cells that where the, the nucleus is still viable, that could be a variety of different diseases. That could include sarcoidosis. That could in uh, certain uh, vascula uh, vasculitis uh, develop into non caseating granuloma. So make sure put those word associations together early, so that when you get to the exam, you'll you'll read liquefactive necrosis and immediately think brain. Thank you to Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track The One True Color off their 2015 album, The Mind Suite. As always, thanks for listening. If you like what we're doing on the Inside the Boards podcast, please subscribe to our show and leave a rating and review on iTunes. We sure appreciate it. Good luck studying. See you back next time.